Hello, I'm Dr. Thomas Spain, and in this week's episode of Curator of the Camera, we're going back to school with Cheltenham. The Southern Railway was formed in 1923 out of three railway companies. These were the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway, the South Eastern and Chatham Railway and the London South Western Railway. It single-mindedly electrified London's railway network for uh, suburban passenger traffic into stations like Waterloo, Victoria and uh, London Bridge. Nevertheless, despite all of this electrification, the Southern Railway was long distance passenger services, its main expresses uh, were still steam hauled. And uh, overseeing the locomotive fleet uh, was a, an engineer called uh, Richard Mansell. And uh, he was an Irish designer, he was born in, in the Dublin area, and he took up an apprenticeship with Henry Ivert of Great Northern Atlantic fame with the Great Southern and Western Railway of Ireland. And uh, in 1913, uh, he would replace Harry Wainwright as locomotive superintendent of the South Eastern and Chatham Railway, uh, thus putting him in position for uh, taking over the locomotive affairs of the newly grouped Southern Railway in 1923. Mansell had built together a very talented team of engineers from the Great Western and Midland Railways, and uh, these were responsible for designing a series of no-nonsense, standardised, go-anywhere locomotives. And um, the first brand new design to emerge from uh, Eastley Works was the Lord Nelson class 4-cylinder 460 of 1926, which was the most powerful locomotive uh, in Britain, briefly. So by 1930, the uh, running department had identified a need for a compact 440 locomotive capable of running at 55 mile per hour with 400 tonne trains. And another key challenge added to the design criteria was uh, that this particular new design would uh, run on a specific route. And this route was the heavily gauge restricted uh, line between Tunbridge and Hastings in Sussex. Indeed, this is a double track line which suffered the problems of periodic tunnel lining issues and also the fact that vehicles that ran on it had to be built specifically to fit through these tunnels. So you couldn't just send any old vehicle between Tunbridge and Hastings. So the, the, the challenges presented to Mansell resulted in, in these, the last 440 designs to emerge in Britain and also the most powerful. So Mansell's new 440 design was officially known as the V-Class. However, the Southern Railway had taken to increasing publicity for itself by giving its locomotive names based upon various themes, whether it's characters from Arthurian legend or were named after various naval personalities. The chief draftsman at Eastley Works uh, decided, therefore, uh, that uh, it would be a good idea to name the locomotives after various public schools served by the railway. And so as a result, the schools class name uh, stuck. So in designing the schools class, Mansell uh, took his Lord Nelson class as a starting point. However, as a four-cylinder 460 uh, was rather heavy, he actually slimmed it down by making the schools class a three-cylinder locomotive. Um, and pretty much um, adopting a three-cylinder locomotive reduced the weight uh, the overall weight and it also meant that the locomotive could be rather more compact um, as well because if, if only two cylinders were adopted the, the cylinders would have likely have been a lot bigger. Towards the front of the locomotive are these big plates that you can see so um, these are what's known as uh, smoke deflectors um, and they essentially uh, help to lift uh, drifting smoke clear of the uh, driver's eye view. The Southern Railway started experimenting with these uh, smoke deflectors in around 1926 
and uh, essentially they, they took as a starting point the deflectors fitted to the German 01 class Pacifics which had been introduced in the same year and then slightly modified them to improve the aesthetics by adding this rather pronounced sort of curve. It's kind of a family likeness on, uh, on various southern locomotive uh, designs. So uh, this here is one of the two clack valves which uh, admit water into the boiler uh, from the tender and uh, from, from the injectors. And uh, you can kind of see the steam dome up on top of the, uh, the boiler there. And then you can see the, uh, the chimney. Now Bully uh, modified uh, 20 members of the class in the end with a uh, wider diameter chimney and multiple uh, jet blast pipes and Cheltenham would have been the 21st locomotive and um, and at the beginning of the Second World War work was done to actually install the new uh, design of chimney uh, but however the project was halted because of uh, presumably because of uh, material shortages and the need for getting everything out on the rails as soon as possible and so Cheltenham never actually ran with with the wider chimney and so this is sort of the the original mantle design of chimney so moving a bit further on this is the slide bar this is the Vorschart valve gear as well um, and we come up to a rather interesting and uh, some might say rather sort of risque uh, blow-off cock which uh, one pulls to open, so it's rather uh, comedic, I guess, but uh, it's, it actually serves a serious purpose. The Southern Railway operated in a uh, hard water district, so that meant there's lots of calcium carbonate and various impurities in the water, which should cause crusting and build-up of uh, scale inside the boiler and inside the firebox. And if you have scale build-up, it creates temperature variations and uh, actually increases stresses on the boiler and firebox plates and eventually can cause failure in extreme circumstances. Now the Southern Railway actually had a water treatment system which helped to address some of the, uh, the uh, hard water issues but uh, it still produced a sludge that would, could settle at the bottom of the boiler. So what this, this valve actually did when you pulled it to open a, a vast jet of steam would actually eject all of this sludge and crud through the bottom of the uh, the boiler and uh, and therefore reduce the issue of scale somewhat so uh, here we can see the Cheltenham nameplate and you can see the schools class legend underneath it uh, we have here the sandbox for the uh, the rear driving wheel then we have sort of the link, this pipe here is the linkage up to the steam manifold in the cab which has some of the controls and the, the driving wheels are pretty much exactly the same diameter as the Lord Nelson class which is six foot seven. That was one of the reasons why essentially he chose to, the Lord Nelson is there'd be a lot of interchangeability of parts and it is kind of a snub-nosed Lord Nelson class as we can see there's only four driving wheels on it and the front bogey which again is of Lord Nelson pattern um, and so it's a 440 version of the Lord Nelson. As part of the design Mansell originally wanted to adopt a slimmed down version of the Lord Nelson class boiler uh, with a bell pair flat sided firebox but the problem was this this would have created a heavy locomotive which would have gone far beyond the weight restrictions of the various routes it would have operated on which is around 21 tonnes and so in order to get around that Mansell and his team adopted a, a slimmed down S15 boiler. As you can see here it improved the visibility from the cab for the uh, driver but also it allowed the designers to meet the restrictions uh, posed by the tunnels on the tunbridge Hastings line because it actually allowed the designers to bring the top half of the cab inwards. You can see a slight angle there to sort of meet the profile of the tunnel and maintain the gauge clearance as, uh, as it went down the route. Here's the uh, locomotive number uh, 30925 
As built by the Southern, it was actually 925. When British Railways emerged in 1948, they put Southern locomotives in the 30,000 series, hence why it's 30925. Uh, 5P is the power rating, uh, 5 passenger. The yellow triangle it relates to the fact that it is fitted with a sort of water treatment regime. Moving along onto the tender, uh, you can see it's a six wheel tender. It carried uh, 4,000 gallons of water and five tons of coal. Uh, here you can kind of see it in, Cheltenham is in sort of the last livery it would have carried essentially before it was withdrawn in 1962. And you can see here that the wheels under the tender are uh, spokes. Now, there's a bit of a variation uh, on the school's class in that some of their tenders actually had disc, solid disc wheels rather than spoked. So there, there, are, there were a variety of wheels to be had. Uh, as you can see here, you have the uh, outside axle boxes, uh, which sort of house the uh, bearings for the axles. Carrying on moving around the tender, uh, again, you can kind of see the inward slant of the, uh, the rave on the tender there, which matches the profile of the cab and keeps the locomotive within the restricted loading gauge of the Tunbridge Hastings route. Uh, this pipe here is very important. It does the uh, steam heating for the carriages. Uh, the southern kind of, certainly the southern region of British Rail, they, they had a sort of a season for steam heating and uh, after which uh, they'd stop using it completely because it did use up valuable coal and water. This is the vacuum brake pipe which uh, is attached to the, uh, the carriage. Three link screw coupling there which you can adjust the tension. Um, You've also got your lamp bracket and some steps that allow you onto the tender in order to access the water filler cap. Uh, the Southern Railway was not a user of the, uh, of the water trough like uh, some of the other members of the Big Four. So that's the uh, walk around the locomotive done. Let's see what's in the cab. Right, so here we are on the footplate of uh, Cheltenham and uh, there's a number of interesting uh, features to point out today. Uh, firstly uh, being uh, this, the Detroit uh, hydrostatic lubricator which uh, admits oil lubricates the cylinders and essentially there's an oil reservoir in there and steam is admitted into th this casing and uh, fills these um, holes here. The, the steam condenses in there forming sort of hot water and oil is, uh, is sort of uh, allowed into each of these chambers and you can see the rate at which the oil is, is kind of entering the chambers uh, through these glass lenses and you can control the rates using controls here. And uh, essentially, the uh, oil eventually goes into the main, into the steam circuit and atomizes on its way down to the uh, pistons and cylinders. Equally important are these oil trays, which relate to the oil lubricating the axle boxes of the, uh, the driving wheels. Because this locomotive was sort of in steam in fairly recent years, uh, we can kind of show you bits and pieces. So you can kind of see the uh, the, the, the wicking that uh, takes the oil down into the pipe pipework that, that you can see under here. And it is quite, quite helpfully labelled as well, so you can kind of see what, what sort of oil pot does what. Then, then you've kind of got the important, all important boiler pressure. So uh, the school's class kind of operated at 220 pounds per square inch. You've got the, uh, the steam heat gauge, um, so you kind of regulate how much steam heat you need um, by looking at the pressure of it. Uh, then you have the uh, gauge glasses for the boiler, uh, make sure the water, uh, water levels uh, at a safe level. It's kind of done by, by, by refraction of the wasp stripes you can see in the back there. Uh, moving a bit further down to the, uh, this side, this is the uh, injector controls um, which admits water into the boiler. These are the damper door sort of levers which control the rate of combustion. You can kind of see they're labelled front damper door on the left, uh, rear damper door on the right. 
Uh, moving across a little bit, we have here a hole for uh, a pole to operate the rocking grate. So the school's class has a rocking grate. Uh, here we have the sort of the fire hole door, which uh, you can kind of see into the cavernous depths of the locomotive. And then uh, moving up from the fire hole door, you, uh, you can see here the regulator, which is obviously shut, uh, kind of on a, on a bit of a quadrant there. You have sort of the steam manifold there, which has various controls. Uh, this is the all-important whistle uh, warning device. Um, and then moving over to here, you, you've got sort of the steam chest pressure gauge, which is useful for the driver because you don't want to dump all of that 220 pounds per square inch into that, otherwise you start slipping. It doesn't do your tyres any good. Uh, the, then you have your speedometer, which is a British Railways sort of standard speedometer. Uh, they were they were fitted quite late on um, in in this uh, in this class's career. Although they were they sometimes had uh, speedometers fitted in the late 30s. Um, this is the brake uh, vacuum pressure gauge, which lets you know what the status of the brake is. Then again, you've kind of got another oil pot. Um, again, you can kind of see it actually belongs to this locomotive as well, as you can see by the 925 on it. Just give you another look inside, just for uh, japes. And uh, you put your mash tin on the uh, on the on the shelf. So if you fancy a brew or anything else that needs to go on there, this is the uh, the vacuum brake uh, control. And then you have here the fun bit of the, uh, so as I said uh, earlier, this locomotive was fully sort of functional up until fairly recently. And so as a result, some of the bits are still quite well lubricated. Uh, one example being this, the screw reverser. So it's different from a lever reverser in that you've got a lot more control over where you can set your cutoff. The cutoff is set in notches of 10%, 10% um, notches. Uh, pretty much from mid gear all the way to full back gear, it's got 74% on, on there and uh, also full forward gear, so this is almost like the gear stick in your car. And to actually operate the reverser, uh, you undo the, uh, the latch like so and then you, you actually turn it so that it adjusts the cutoff setting. So I'm just putting it into full forward and then you secure it and then off you go, ready, put your hand on the regulator and start to move off, keeping your eye on the steam chest pressure gauge so that you don't start slipping and then as you're moving off you slowly start to wind back towards mid gear so that you're using your steam more efficiently and not wasting any. So here we go, we're going back towards mid-gear, a little bit stiff, either that or I'm completely out of condition, it's probably the latter. And uh, here we are in mid-gear, having come to a stop, a safe stop, and uh, there we have it, that's the reverser, the screw reverser. So the school's class is uh, very much uh, a fantastic piece of engineering. It kind of all came together almost out from the word go. It's a really powerful locomotive. It could do what it said on the tin and actually did a little bit more. It's very much the pocket battleship of uh, locomotives. And I really do think they are Mansell's masterpiece. So if you enjoyed my uh, lines on Cheltenham, why not subscribe to the National Rail Museum's YouTube channel and learn more about the fast, weird and wonderful and fascinating objects that we have in the collection.